Okay, let's see. N.T. Wright. Ben Witherington. Hey, who put this book by Danielle Steele in here? <laughs> oh, hello, folks. Just weeding out some older stuff in my personal library. You know, as a professional librarian and a researcher, I'm often asked to recommend a good source for different types of information. But how do you know what a good source is? Well, there's some guidelines you can use for that. Let's check them out using some of my books here. Now, I've got one guideline you may have heard me beat into the ground a lot, but I'll beat it some more and some more. It's called Check Their Credentials. This is a book by one of my favorite scholars, Ben Witherington. Let's see what it says about him. Ah, huh, pretty impressive. This guy has some kind of education. Maybe I can find out more about him online, too. Whoa! He's got a curriculum vita that would choke a horse. Okay, now let's look at some of these books I have by Fundy Atheists. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Bible Boo-Boos by C. Dennis McWeasel. This guy has a degree in... economics. That's not relevant to biblical studies, is it? Okay, uh, God Really Stinks by Dork Darkins. Uh, head of the Freethinking Atheist Response Team. That's it? No education? Sheesh. What's that? Yeah, okay, I know what you fundy atheists are thinking. Just because a guy doesn't have a bunch of letters behind his name doesn't mean he's right. Yeah, that's true. I'd say the same myself, and I've tackled more than a few guys with PhDs. But here's the thing. Credentials do help establish credibility if you've never heard of an author before. They also suggest that if this degree guy on the one hand says X, and this guy over here who collects stamps says Y, the guy who says X is more likely to deserve the benefit of the doubt and the burden is on the guy who says why to provide a better argument. Okay, step two, and this is similar. Check their sources. I open up this book by Witherington. In the back you have this thing called a bibliography. You can see what kind of sources it lists. All of them serious academic sources. This shows that this guy does his homework. Now, in contrast, McWeasel here, uh, five sources. All of them fundy atheists just like him. Two of them were written before 1800. Now this is a pretty fair warning sign. When someone uses only a few sources, it's very likely they haven't done any serious research. Of course, it also depends on how much they've actually written. Five notes would maybe be all you'd need for a pamphlet, but not for something called the Encyclopedia of Bible Boo-Boos that's as thick as a phone book, right? Okay, also watch out for a source that gives either incomplete citations or none at all and watch out for anything that uses sources that are really old. Unless the book is a review of history or something like that, high use of sources that aren't recent could be a sign of someone not doing critical research. Especially when it's a field like Biblical Studies where a lot of work and research has been done since the time the Bible was written. Then there's a few other tricks to watch out for. For example, piggybacking. That's not what I mean. Let me use an example someone sent me once. There was an author who mentioned the Inquisition and used a credentialed source to back up a certain claim. In the next sentence, which was made to seem to be a direct continuation of what was said earlier, the author gave a standard claim about the Inquisition claiming over 500,000 victims. They do this to make it seem like a credible source supports their claim, but in reality, that expert didn't give that number of 500,000. Another thing to watch out for is padding, listing sources in a bibliography that are not actually used or are used sparingly or selectively. A great example is how Freak and Gandhi made use of this Dionysus on the Cross picture, while failing to report that one of their sources said it was declared a forgery by experts. Now, a related issue is, what about recommendations on a book? Do they mean anything? Well, they can. On the back of this book by Witherington, you can see a whole bunch of them by other scholars. What's particularly noteworthy is that these are not all by people who are as conservative as Witherington is. If good comments come from a fairly broad ideological spectrum, you're likely in good shape. Recommends from a narrow spectrum are less worthwhile, but still good. Recommends from nobodies or relative nobodies in context, like a movie star recommending Dennis McWeasel, 
don't help a bit. Recommends from professional reviewing sources like Publishers Weekly can be useful depending on the credentials of the reviewer or their experience. Watch out though when the recommend seems too short. A great example of this would be the way Robert Eisenman's book, James the Brother of Jesus, used a review of the book by Kirkus Reviews. Eisenman is a nutcase, so it seems strange that a place as reputable as Kirkus called his book fascinating reading. We'll take a look at what the whole context of that phrase is. That's verging on false advertising. 